Good morning. My name is Tom Hall, and I'm the senior pastor at First Presbyterian Church in Pittsburgh. Welcome to our live stream worship this morning, which will start in just a few minutes with our prelude music. Thank you for joining us. Good morning. Good morning. We want to welcome you all here to First Presbyterian Church. And uh, what we do here at First Presbyterian Church is we worship the risen and reigning Lord Jesus Christ. And what that means is, is that we're here to, to lay down our burdens, throw them down before him, and praise Jesus. Um, several announcements, one of which is we have, um, if you are visiting if you've uh, not been uh, to First Presbyterian Church at all, we have a book for you. We have a book, if you're interested. It's a, a, a book that uh, Pastor Tom has referenced and uh, has, has preached plenty of sermons on, uh, The Prodigal God. Um, not, not the book itself, but the, the, the topic. It it's centers around the prodigal son and the story in, in Luke 15. Um, we, would, we would love to welcome you with this book and kind of let you know what we are about here at First Presbyterian Church. Um, another announcement is that if you've been vaccinated, we encourage you, you could take off your mask. Um, uh, we're, we're not, we're not uh, creating any uh, uh, rules, any, any constraints around that. If you've been vaccinated, please feel free to take off your mask. And um, also another announcement is, is that we have Bible studies going on each and every week, um, one on Sunday night and one on Wednesday night. Uh, I lead the one on Sunday night, and um, Tom, Pastor Tom leads the one on uh, Wednesday night. And each Bible study is, is, is centered around what, what we preached on that week, and uh, the sermon will be uh, discussed 
and the passage that we've preached upon will be uh, discussed to greater detail. So if you have any questions, if you have any thoughts, if you have, you hear something in the sermon and you want to kind of iron out what, what you heard, or you want to uh, bring it up to, to either Tom or, or myself, here's an opportunity. They're both at 6 o'clock, correct? Oh, 7 o'clock on Wednesday, 6 o'clock on Sunday. If you're interested, please feel free to contact me uh, or Pastor Tom or the, the main office, Cheryl. I can, uh, feel free to call or email. With that in mind, um, I invite Frank up for the call to worship. Let us turn our hearts and minds to worship our God. Please stand and join me in the call to worship. Blessed be God, eternal majesty, living word, abiding spirit. Jesus said, the way to see God's dream for the world is to be born from above by the Spirit. That gift is available this day. May you receive God's Spirit, be made whole, and dwell more deeply in love divine. Amen. Invisible God, only wise, in the light inaccessible, hid from our eyes. Most blessed, most glorious, the Ancient of Days, Almighty, victorious, thy great name we praise. Unresting, unhasting, and silent as light, nor wanting, nor wasting, thou rulest in might. Thy justice like mountains, I soaring above, thy clouds which are fountains of goodness and love. To all life thou givest, to both great and small, in all life thou livest, the true life of all. We blossom and flourish like leaves on the tree, then wither and perish, but not changeth thee. Thou reignest in glory, thou rulest in light, thine angels adore thee, all veiling their sight. All praise we would render, O oh, help us to see, tis only the splendor of light hideth thee. Please be seated. As we prepare to hear the word of our Lord, let us tear down the barriers that keep us from being comfortable with him. Please join me in our corporate prayer of confession, followed silently by our personal prayers of confession. Holy God, we know that you are always there to lead us, yet we somehow lose our way and fall back 
into fear. We confess that we have stumbled and recognize our need for you to lift us up and help us start again. Forgive us our failings. Restore to us to strength and reconcile us with you, ourselves, and each other. Through the power of Christ and the gift of your spirit. Amen. Amen. Sisters and brothers, hear the good news. We did not receive the spirit of slavery, but rather the spirit of adoption. Your guilt has departed. Your sin is blotted out, for you are God's beloved children, forgiven, loved, and free. May God's peace be with you. I invite Jana now to come forward for the children's night. Thank you for joining me. It's good to see you here today. I've missed you. Today's Bible story is from the Family Story Bible. It's got great stories in it because they're God's stories. It's such a long way, Miriam sighed. I know, said Aaron. It's hot in the daytime and cold at night. Where have we heard that before? It's hot in the day and cold at night. Isn't that a desert story? Uh, yeah. And I'm so hungry. Oh, so am I, said Miriam. But there's nothing to eat. The Hebrew people hadn't eaten anything for days. Why did you drag us into the desert to die? They said to Moses. We were slaves in Egypt, but we had enough to eat. Now we're not slaves, but we're so hungry. You've made things worse again. Believe me, said Moses, God got us out of Egypt. And God will give us food. And sure enough, in the evening, a whole flock of birds flew into their camp. The people caught them and cooked them for food. And the next morning, they found some white, sticky stuff growing on the plants and on the ground. They called it manna. Mmm, this is good, said Miriam. What does it taste like, said Aaron. Mm, sort of like a biscuit made with honey. And I like it. So Moses told the people that manna would come every day. This is God's bread, he said. Gather just enough for one day. Except on the sixth day, gather twice as much. Because the seventh day is our Sabbath, a day of rest. Gather enough for the Sabbath on the sixth day so you can rest on the seventh. And Moses said to his people, God is with us. Remember that. God is with us. We are God's people. But the people didn't always remember. It's hard to remember that God cares about you when you're hungry and thirsty and tired and hot and homesick, but God does care. Let's pray. Holy God, <clears throat> thank you for caring for us by sending bread to eat. Help us to trust you each and every day. In Jesus' name, amen.
Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou bidst me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relieve, because thy promise I believe, O Lamb of God, I come. Just as I am thy love unknown, as broken every barrier down, now to be thine, yea, thine alone, O Lamb of God. I come, I come. Please be seated. Would you pray with me? Oh, gracious and loving God, you sent your one and only Son to be one of us, to live for us, to die for us, and be raised for us. And Lord, now by the power of the Holy Spirit, we may experience the bread of life. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Well, you know, we're working our way this year through the Gospel of John. We're spending all year in the Gospel of John, and we're spending several weeks in John chapter 6. It is full of wonderful wonderful stuff. The lesson today is John 6, verses 22 through 35. Recall that Jesus had fed the 5,000, meaning 5,000 men. When you counted women and children, there may have been three or four times as many. Jesus had taken a little boy's lunch of a few barley loaves and fish and had passed it out to all the people in the crowd, and they all had enough to eat their fill. There was enough left over to, to fill 12 baskets. Well, that evening, the disciples had left in a boat crossing the lake headed for Capernaum while Jesus had stayed behind. As they rowed across the lake, a storm came up, but Jesus came walking alongside them as if he was out for a Sunday stroll. No effort at all. The disciples were terrified, but Jesus said, I am don't fear. I am. Don't fear. But then the disciples were really terrified. I am, of course, was how God had identified himself to Moses out of the burning bush back in Exodus chapter 3. I am is God's name for God, and Jesus had claimed it for himself. Well, Jesus got into a boat with the disciples, and immediately the boat arrived at its destination. Now, we tend to overlook that particular part of the miracle, but doesn't it make sense? If Jesus is the great I am, if he is Lord over nature, 
if he is without beginning and without end, the source of life, does it not make sense that you want to be in the boat with Jesus, that he is the destination, he is life's destination, he is the point of life. But Jesus, that that night had left the site of the miracle without telling the crowd where they were going. And now they woke up the next morning confused. John 6, beginning at verse 22. The next day, the crowd that had stayed on the opposite shore of the lake realized that only one boat had been there and that Jesus had not entered it with his disciples. But they had gone away alone. Well, then some boats from Tiberias landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after the Lord had given thanks. Once the crowd realized that neither Jesus nor his disciples were there, they got into boats and went to Capernaum in search of Jesus. When they found him on the other side of the lake, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Jesus answered, Very truly I tell you, you are looking for me because you saw the signs I perform- not because you saw the signs I performed, but because you ate your fill of the loaves and had your fill. Do not work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give you. For on him God the Father has placed his seal of approval. Then they asked him. What must we do to do the works God requires? Jesus answered, The work of God is this, to believe in the one he has sent. So they asked him, What sign then will you give that we may see it and believe you? What will you do? Our ancestors ate the manna in the wilderness. As it is written, he gave them bread from heaven to eat. Jesus said to them, Very truly I tell you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread from heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the true bread from heaven. For the bread of God is the bread that comes down from heaven and gives life to the world. Sir, they said, always give us this bread. Then Jesus declared, I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. And whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. The word of the Lord. Well, the people woke up that morning and they were confused. They wondered where Jesus had gone. The night before, they'd seen the boat leave with the disciples, but Jesus hadn't been in it. And as they were wondering, more boats of seekers landed there. And they had been, they'd been from Tiberias coming in search of Jesus. So they got into the boats with the seekers and they set off in search of Jesus. And they asked him, when they found him near Capernaum, they asked him, Rabbi, when did you get here? Now on the one hand, I think it's a fair question. They hadn't seen Jesus leave the night before with the disciples. But you see, we know, we've read through the Gospel of John, we know how this works. But the people, well, they really didn't know what they were talking about. We know that Jesus is the great I am, without beginning. He's without end. In a sense, Jesus has always been here. He's the beginning of everything. He's the point of everything. The crowd didn't understand the incarnation, that Jesus, the one who spoke creation into being, had come from heaven to become human and to live for us and die for us and be raised for us. The crowd apparently didn't know that Jesus had taken a shortcut to Capernaum by walking across the lake. So when the crowd asked, Rabbi, when did you get here? Again, they really didn't know what they were asking. And so Jesus said, you're only looking for me because you ate all the bread you wanted yesterday. And now you are coming to me for a snack when I can give you the food of eternal life. You know, I was doing an inventory in my mind, and it's, it takes a long time of the great meals I've enjoyed over the years, the memorable 
meals. There were ordinary family meals around on the kitchen table. There were big Thanksgiving celebrations, Fourth of July celebrations, Memorial Day picnics, wedding receptions, and, and of course, intimate meals with just Jana and me. Special meals. As I grew more serious about my faith, as I inventoried those meals, as I thought about a meal, I began to understand that those meals were glimpses of the life God intended. After all, Jesus spent all his time, lots of his time, eating with his friends. On the night of the resurrection, he revealed himself over a meal to his disciples. Wedding receptions always, even now, always remind me of Jesus' great miracle at the wedding at Cana. Not just Jesus turning water into wine, of course God can do that, but that the Lord of the wine was at the feast. So meals are glimpses of the life God intended. If you come and share in one of the meals here on Tuesday nights with our friends at Outreached Arms, there is a good chance that Jesus will reveal himself to you at that very meal here in the basement. But I've discovered something about eating one of these great meals that even after the most wonderful meal, you get hungry again. You get hungry again. Maybe the next day, maybe just in a few hours. So here in this passage, Jesus was pointing, you see, to a kind of food, a kind of meal that only he offers. And that even in the best meals we experience in this life, we're just getting a glimpse of it. And so he told the crowd, don't work for food that spoils, but for food that endures to eternal life. Verse 28 said, says, they asked him, well, what do we do? to do the works God requires. And Jesus answered, the work of God, the work of God is this, to believe in the one he's sent. Now, this is important, and I don't think this translation quite captures the meaning here. The New Revived trans, Revised Translation, I think, is a bit better. It says, this is the work of God, that you believe in him who he has sent. The point is, there is no work for us to do. All the work is done by God. Eugene Peterson translated it this way, sign on with the one that God has sent. That kind of commitment gets you in on God's works. The crowds wanted to know, what do we do, Jesus? And the answer is, you don't do anything. Just believe. But the people weren't satisfied with that answer. They had rowed across the lake to find him. Surely something must be done by someone. And so they turned the question around. Then oh, they said, okay, Jesus, then what will you do? What sign will you perform that we might believe? And I want to say, what, wait a minute. Didn't Jesus attract that crowd in the first place because, because of all the miracles that he'd been doing? Didn't those 5,000 men show up and experience a miracle the day before? Weren't those the ones who'd eaten all the bread they wanted? Do you think Jesus could have done anything, anything to satisfy them? They would have always, you see, wanted just one more miracle. Well, they said, well, our ancestors ate manna in the desert. And of course, here is John's great irony on display again. They were comparing God's provision of manna for 40 years in the desert to Jesus one afternoon of bread by the lake. They were implying that Jesus needed to come up with something big, bigger, and it better be soon. But you see, they were forgetting manna's limitations. It was fresh every morning. All you had to do was go out and pick it up off the ground. And the point was, to go out every morning and to depend on God every day. If you tried to collect more than what you could eat in a day, it would spoil, except for the sixth day when it would last through the Sabbath as well. But the point is that manna didn't last. It didn't satisfy. 
And the people complained about it too. They wanted meat, so they got quail. They longed for the vegetables they ate while they were slaves in Egypt. So even if Jesus had given them manna, they wouldn't have believed, at least not for long. And so Jesus told them, God gave your ancestors manna, but now God is going to give you a different kind of bread. It's a once and for all bread that gives life forever to the whole world. Now the Greek word for life in this passage is zoe, zoe. We only have one word for life in English, but in Greek there are two, zoe and bios. Now the meanings overlap quite a bit, but zoe life means exuberant life, vital life, fullness of life, the life God intended. And that is the word John uses in this passage three times. The crowd said, give us this bread. To which Jesus replied, I am the bread of life. I am the bread of the fullness of life, the exuberance of life, the life God intended. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry. Who believes in me will never be thirsty. And so, how do you define the good life? I mean, seriously, how do you define the good life? Have you thought about it? Could you describe it? If you were actually given the fullness of life, you were, if you were living right now the good life, would you even know it? Would you even know it? You know, I ask this of a lot of the couples who come here to be married, and I don't think anyone has ever, any one of them has ever been able to articulate it. They talk about having enough money to be comfortable, living in a nice house, being safe. But how much money do you need for the good life? What kind of house do you need? How much money do you need? How important is your career? How much money do you make? I have talked here many times about getting my dream job back in my Air Force career about the 18-year point. It was at Mather Air Force Base in Sacramento, California, a great place. But I never mentioned that when I was the commander of that, when I had that dream job, we lived in a house on base that was way too small to hold our stuff. And so we had one whole wall of our garage, single car garage, stacked floor to ceiling with boxes that wouldn't fit in the house. The bathroom was tiny. And since they were closing the base, the house was run down. They weren't fixing it. But you know, after a few weeks, we got used to that house. We adjusted, and partly because we had great neighbors, fun neighbors, including the family next door, who they, went, they bought a, a whole bunch of these pink plastic flamingos, and they planted it in everybody's yard on the street. They renamed the street Flamingo Row, and they started having contests every week about who decorated the flamingo the best. So when the base inspectors came around and said, well, you didn't coil your hose or, or trim your grass, we could mock the base inspectors. We still exchange Christmas cards with them. They're still friends. But the base, you see, is closed. It is gone. They repurposed the airfield, but some of those buildings where we worked, where we poured our life into, they're gone. The street where we lived is gone. It's a new subdivision. How do you define the good life? Being healthy? Being in shape? Looking good? Being able to travel? Have the, having the freedom to do what you want? Kids or spouse who love you? Friends, everything outside of Jesus Christ is going to give out. It's going to wear out. Or if it's kids, they're going to move out. 2009, Jenna went back to that place, the former Mather Air Force Base. There's a new subdivision. You can hardly even find where our street used to be. And they had torn down the building 
that held the squadron I led. The only thing left is the parking lot, and there was a special commander's parking place painted on the ground, and you could still see the squadron logo in faded paint in the parking lot. You know, we had worked hard for that. We had not only worked hard, we dreamed about that job. And that was all that was left. But Jesus Christ is offering Zoe life. Exuberant, abundant, full, eternal life. Jesus says you don't have to work. The work is God's. You, don't, you just have to believe. You just accept the faith that God has given you, and you point it back to Jesus Christ. You trust him. You center your life around him. You pray to him, study him, meditate on him. And as you do that, in the power of the Holy Spirit, you become more and more like him. And the point of life becomes clearer. Life becomes fuller because he is the point. And so this passage offers one very practical point of application, just one point. Remember, this passage began with the crowd being confused about where Jesus had gone. It says, then boats with more people started arriving. And in John 6, 23, John says, the boats landed near the place where the people had eaten the bread after Jesus had given thanks. And that's sort of a convoluted line. It sounds like a throwaway line, but I wonder. You know, John ordinarily writes with great economy. He doesn't waste words. Again, he says, the people had eaten after the Lord had given thanks. The thanksgiving had preceded the miracle. A year and a half ago, we read this great little book by Anne Voskamp called 1,000 Gifts. It was about the importance of gratitude and giving thanks, and not just giving thanks when something nice happens to you, but making it a habit, practicing, practicing gratitude all the time, making gratitude a habit. John said that this was the place where the people had eaten after the Lord had given thanks. The Greek word for give thanks is eucharisteo, And as Anne Voskamp said again and again, thanksgiving always precedes the miracle. But why did Jesus need to give thanks? Isn't Jesus the author of life, the creator of everything? Wasn't it his bread? Wasn't it his fish? It must be that gratitude is part of the divine nature. It must be, the gratitude must be part of worship. And didn't God make us in his image? Isn't part of the divine nature in each of us? So when we don't worship, when we don't give thanks, when we aren't grateful, the conditions are simply not right for a full life. The conditions aren't right for miracles. (laughs) And what is a miracle anyway? We think a miracle is a suspension of the natural order. But I don't think so. I think miracles are a restoration of the natural order. A miracle is like a great meal. It's there to give us a glimpse of how God intended life to be. So Jesus multiplying loaves and fish, turning water into wine, healing the sick, were glimpses of life as God intended life to be. God didn't create us to live in scarcity. He created us to live with him in a garden, to enjoy the finest of foods any time we wanted. He didn't create us to get sick, to get old and die. The miracles were signs to point to Jesus Christ and the life God intended for us at creation. So when you fail to give thanks, you violate your own nature. And so every time you eat, every time you eat, give thanks. Give thanks every time at home, in a restaurant, not just a great Thanksgiving meal, every time, even when you're going through the drive-thru at Burger King. Give thanks. 
It is all God's food. Give thanks. And the more you give thanks, like Ann Voskamp says, for sunlight on the floor, for a bird sitting on a branch, for kids playing down the hall, the more miracles you'll notice and the more fullness of life you'll grasp. Give thanks. Well, when the crowd had caught up with Jesus on the other side of the lake, they wanted to know, when did you get here? But Jesus is the great I am. He's always been here, and he always will be. They wanted to know, what must we do? He says, you don't do anything. It's God's work, and it's already done. Just believe me. They turned the question around and asked, well, what will you do? And he says, I am the sign. I am the I am. I am the bread of life. Tony Campolo is a sociologist and pastor and speaker And he told the story of sitting with his parents in worship when he was six or seven years old. And he remembered that day communion was being served. And he noticed a a woman in the pew right in front of them who was sobbing and shaking. So the minister had just reading reading the passage from 1 Corinthians 11, 27. It's where the apostle Paul said, whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner, will be guilty of sinning against the body and blood of the Lord. Tony Campolo said, as the communion plate with the small pieces of bread was passed to the crying woman, she waved it away and then lowered her head in despair. It was then, he said, that my Sicilian father leaned over her shoulder and in his broken English said sternly, take it, girl. It was meant for you. Do you hear me? She raised her head and nodded, and then she took the bread and ate it. I knew that at that moment some kind of heavy burden was lifted from her heart and mind. Since then, I have always known that a church that could offer communion to hurting people was a special gift from God. Friends, what could you or I possibly do to deserve to sit down at the table with the great I am? Of course, the answer is nothing. But the bread of life, you see, has come to you. Eat and never go hungry. Believe in him and never be thirsty. Amen. Would you pray with me? Oh, gracious God, we thank you for life. We thank you for the abundant life you offer now and for eternal life all through your Son, Jesus Christ. We thank you that he became one of us, lived with us, died for us, and was raised for us. We thank you for the glimpses of the abundant life that are all around us, Show us once more how to be grateful. Remind us to practice gratitude all the time that we might see you at work and that each of us might grow more and more and more into the image of Jesus Christ. On this Memorial Day weekend, we are especially grateful for the men and women of our armed forces who paid the ultimate sacrifice and that that we might live and worship in freedom. We lift up Gold Star families, our wounded warriors, and all who serve our country now in far away and dangerous places. Lord, we pray for your world. We thank you that the ceasefire between Israel and Hamas seems to be holding. We pray for the day when your peace would rule in the Holy Land. We pray for our nation. We lift up our leaders at all levels. We pray pray for an end to racism and an end to violence of all kinds. We pray for police and first responders. 
We continue to ask your blessing on our medical workers, and we praise you for the progress toward the end of this pandemic. We pray for our city. We pray for an end to human trafficking. We lift up the hungry in our city, those without adequate shelter, the marginalized and the mentally ill. We pray for an end to violence, and Lord, there were so many shootings again yesterday. Lord, end the violence. We lift up our city's leaders and its workers, and we ask your blessing upon the city center churches. And we pray for First Presbyterian Church of Pittsburgh. We thank you for the blessings you've poured out on this church. Lord, guide us as we proclaim your abundant life here in the heart of the city. Help us to care for those in our church family who are hurting. Help us to comfort those who mourn. And hear us now as we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil, for thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. More than ever, we are bombarded with all kinds of news and streaming services and social media posts. We're bombarded all day long. And so we take, to counteract that, we take one minute on a Sunday morning to recite an ancient creed together to remind us the core of what we believe. Would you stand and let's say the Apostles' Creed together? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. We now have the privilege to respond to God's grace and return a portion of the blessings he has given to us. Today, let us praise God for the Christ-like qualities he has bestowed on the soldiers and veterans who have ensured the freedoms we all enjoy today. The Department of Veteran Affairs cites these Christ-like attributes excuse me, that our soldiers and veterans embrace. They are disciplers, and this is true for all godly soldiers. One of their primary focuses in life is helping others and look more like Christ. Soldiers are encouragers. They encourage others by coming alongside them. Christ's soldiers are servants. They essentially say, what is the need, and I'll do my best to meet it, or find someone who can. Godly soldiers serve God and others. Christ's soldiers are faithful. They are honest. Christ's soldiers use their gifts to serve God and others, to persevere through difficulties. Christ's soldiers are loving. Godly soldiers are not only loving, but they also constantly seek to help others love as well. In fact, Jesus says, by this, all men will know you are my disciples if you love one another. Christ's soldiers are intercessors, where worldly soldiers put confidence in their strength, training, and knowledge. Godly soldiers understand that they are equipped for even the most mundane tasks. Only God's grace and strength will do. Therefore, they are constant intercessors in prayer. 
Let us praise God with our gifts and offerings for modeling these attributes to the many brave and men and women who have fought for our freedoms. Amen. the bread of life. You are the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. You are the bread of life, Jesus. You are the bread of life. You are the bread of life. You are the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry, and he who believes in me will never be thirsty. You are the bread of life, Jesus, you are the bread of life. This is my body that was broken. This is my blood that was shed for you. Take and eat and drink it. Remember me. Remember. the bread of life. You are the bread of life. He who comes to me will never go hungry. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. He who comes to me will never go hungry. And he who believes in me will never be thirsty. You are the bread of life. Jesus, you are the bread of life. the bread of life. You are the bread of
God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Alleluia, alleluia. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Alleluia, 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 alleluia. Let us pray. Gracious and loving God, we return to you a small portion of your many gifts to us. We dedicate them to you along with our time, our talents, and our very lives, because we know that they all come from your goodness to us. Multiply these gifts that your will might be done on earth. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. your light is come the spirits call obey show forth the glory of your God which shines on you today arise your light is come fling wide the prison door Proclaim the captive's liberty, good tidings to the poor. Arise, your light is come, all you in sorrow born. Bind up the broken-hearted ones and comfort those who mourn. Arise, your light is come, the mountains burst in song. Rise up like eagles on the wing, God's power will make us strong. What's a good life? What does it mean to have a full life? Have you thought about it? How much money do you need? How big a house? You know, I pursued all those things, but the thing is, everything outside of Jesus Christ that you pursue will either give out, wear out, or move out. But Jesus Christ is the bread of life. He is the I am. He is the beginning. He is the end. He is life's destination. And all he asks is that you believe in him. And now, may the Christ who walks on wounded feet walk with you on the road. May the Christ who serves with wounded hands stretch out your hands to serve. May the Christ who loves with a wounded heart open your heart to love. And may you see the face of Christ in everyone you meet. And may everyone you meet see the face of Christ in you. Alleluia. Amen. <laughs> 